Well, this morning I would like to bring greetings from our president of Center for Global Leadership and Development, formerly known as Southern Asia Bible College. So I bring greetings from the president and the uh, faculty team and all the members of uh, the CGLD and also Global School of Open Learning. And I also bring greetings from uh, my church, uh, Global Worship Center AG from Bangalore. Well, before uh, I go ahead, um, I would like to wish all the mothers in the house a very happy uh, Mother's Day. Well, I came across uh, B attitudes for mothers. I read this in the first service. So those who were not uh, there in the first service will have an opportunity to listen to this. So let me read. I didn't write this, but I came across this. So the author is unknown. So if you'd like to use it, please do uh, use it. This is how it goes. Uh, Blessed are the mothers who love God. For their children shall not be ignorant of their creator and his plans concerning them. Blessed are the mothers who love the word of God. For their children shall know the way, the truth and the life. Blessed are the mothers who love the house of God. For their children shall enter there and sit with them in the presence of God. Blessed are the mothers who love to fight life's battles bravely with, stro with a strong and steadfast faith in God. For their children shall know where to find strength in the time of need. Isn't it beautiful? And the author is unknown. If you'd like to use it, please do go ahead and use it. Share it with people and thank God for our mothers. If we are seated here, if I'm standing here in front of you, I'm grateful for my mother and for uh, my parents. And likewise, uh, each of us who are seated here, may the Lord blesses. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please do turn with me to Psalm 22. Let me read uh, the first verse of the Psalm. Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from cries of my anguish. My God, my God, why? One of the questions that many of us would have asked during uh, the span last two years is this question, isn't it? I don't know whether you asked this question. I have asked that question during this last couple of years through the things that we have witnessed. I came cross and I was pushed to a corner to ask this question, my God, my God, why? Unfortunately, sometimes we use this verse only during a Good Friday service, especially when we are meditating on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But have you been in that place in the last couple of years when you lost a dear one, when you lost a job, when you got a pay cut or something that didn't expect? That, did, that you didn't expect happened to you or something that was unexpected happened to you. Did you ask this question? My God, my God, why me? Because sometimes those according to your uh, standards, they are not so uh, faithful, they are not so devout, they are not so pious, but all for them was good. But for you, you were confronted with the unexpected things did you ask that question, my God, my God, why? If you have asked that question, I want us to go through the psalm because the psalmist go through, goes through something similar so that we could identify ourselves with the psalmist this morning and find few answers for these questions, for these life questions, how to respond to these questions when we are confronted with similar situations. So follow with me as we read through the psalm. I'm going to take us through the whole psalm, um, but we're going to do it differently as we look into this portion of scripture. So follow with me in verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the ways that you have ministered to us this morning, oh God. 
Even as we kind of listen to your word, Lord, you speak to us. Give us listening ears and an obedient heart. May you challenge our hearts this morning. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Fill each of us with the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go through this psalm, I want us to identify ourselves with the psalmist. Because most of the times, as I said at the beginning, we use this psalm only to refer to the words of Jesus on the cross. Is that the only thing of this psalm? Or is it more to it? That's what we're going to look at and identify ourselves with this psalmist and uh, respond to God's word this morning. If you look at this psalm, there are three laments. So I'm going to uh, title our study this morning as, My God, My God, Why? And as we ask this question, let us listen to the voice of the psalmist where he, he is confronted with the same thing, the troubles. He is, for the first thing that we see in the psalm is the troubles that the, that the psalmist is confronted with. What are the troubles? And these troubles are put in three laments. So let us identify what are those three laments, how you and I can identify with the psalmist as well. So look at the first two verses talks about the lament of longing for God. The lament for longing. Have you ever been there in the shoes where the psalmist is? Because the psalmist searches for God, but he couldn't find. He cries out to God, but he couldn't hear any answer. He's expecting God to deliver him, but there is no deliverance. Have you been there sometimes? Have you experienced the silence of God? Let me tell you, the silence of God is too loud to bear. I don't know whether you've been there, but that is true. And here is a psalmist who cries out to God. Who seeks to find God. But he couldn't find. There is a complete opposite to what his theology is. What has he read? When you cry out to God. There is deliverance. But now he is crying out. And there is no deliverance. And he is seeking God. But he couldn't find. And that's what we see with the psalmist here. Have you been there sometimes? If you haven't been there. May God forbid. But unfortunately, the life situations are like this. Sometimes, one or the other way, we might face such situations in life. Here is a psalmist who was longing for God, but he couldn't find. In the moment of his need, in the moment of his comforting time, or when he is seeking for comfort, he couldn't find comfort, he couldn't find peace, he couldn't find the presence. All that he sees is the silence of God. And if you have come across silence of God in your life, and if you're asking the similar questions like the psalmist, let me tell you something. It's not just the psalmist is not just confronted with the silence of God or the absence of God. There's something else. Follow with me now in verse 6 to 8. This is the second lament. The first lament is a lament for the longing of God. Number two is the lament of that he see that he is loath, he is surrounded by others. If you look at verse 6, you will see. But I am, I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by everyone, despised by people. All who, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in God, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. The first thing... Is the absence of God. He couldn't find. And the second thing is. Is the reality where he is surrounded by people. And he is surrounded by people. And all these people are hurling insults at him. At times when you expect people to give you shoulders. But they are the ones who turn against you. And here is the psalmist. Who is confronted by people. And all that he feels is he, he, he feels like he's a small worm. A small worm, that's all he feels. Because the insults, the pain, the, uh, the, humil the humiliation that they have brought upon him is so much that he feels very small. Have you been there sometimes? When you expected people to come around you, give their shoulders, all that you, expect, all that you experienced was insults, pain, shame. Have you been there sometimes? And here's the psalmist. The trouble that he faces. On one side is the absence of God. On the other side he's surrounded by people who are supposed to help him. Are hurling insults at him. If God is his primary problem. 
Let me tell you, those around him comes again. They certainly do nothing to help him to overcome the problem. But as we all know, it's something like just adding fuel to the fire that is already there. The absence of God filled with people who insults them. And this is not the only lament that we see. We see another lament that we see here in the psalm. The third lament is he's lamenting for himself. If you look at verse number 12 to 18, let me read verse 12 to 13 and later we'll read 18. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. And it goes on. The first lament was about the absence of God. The second lament was about the people who hurl insults at him. And the third lament is about himself. Where he looks so small. He is, looks that he is surrounded by the mighty bulls. He is surrounded by lions. Later on you will see. And you will also see that he is surrounded by dogs. That's what he feels. The trouble. The pain. The struggles. And this morning. My dear people of God. If you have been in any of these shoes. Where you have been insulted by people. Where you are left lonely in your life. Where you are confronted with things that you didn't expect. It. All that you did was good. But all that you received for yourself was pain, pain and pain. If that's the place that you were in. And if you are being someone who is crying out, looking at God and say, My God, my God, why me? It could be in terms of sickness. It could be be in terms of financial crisis, emotional crisis, or whatever you could list. I don't know what you're going through. And you, if you want to add another lament to this psalm, if you want to add another lament of yours to this, it's fine. But in the midst of all these troubles, the psalmist doesn't stop with his lament. That's the beauty of God's word. And that's the beauty of the psalm as well. Because it is not just a lament. It is not just a psalm of lament. But it is a psalm shows the trust of the psalmist in God. So the second important truth I would like to share with us this morning is the trust that the psalmist shows. First is the trouble of the psalmist and second what we see is the trust. First is the trouble and the second is the trust. But before we go into the trust you need to understand that this psalmist as we you know as we look at the psalmist the people around him are looking at him and saying, it's over, it's finished. If you look at, um, if you look at verse number uh, 15, look at what, what people around him are saying. Because this is what people are thinking. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So this is a physical, not just a physical exhaustion, but he is also into an emotional exhaustion. Have it sometimes happened when you are so stressed up, when you are so anxious that it feels like your tongue is dry, your mouth is dry, your tongue is sticking to your mouth. And here is what the similar exhaustion that the psalmist is going through. And as you look at verse number... Uh, Verse number 18, you will see, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots, lots for my garment. That's what, the reason the people around him are thinking, oh, he's all, already over, it's finished, it's gone. And he's not going to survive anymore, let us take up his belongings. And that is the situation. And now I want you to understand, this is the situation that the psalmist is in. He's not just in pain, he's not just crying out about something that's happening. But he's looking at, people are mocking at him. He's looking at, he himself is dried up, emotionally drained. And on the other side, people think, oh, even when he's still alive, people are dividing his garments before his eyes. That is the situation, that is the pain. As I said, if you are in the similar shoes this morning, let us, we have an important lesson to learn from the psalmist. If you are emotionally dried, you be emotionally drained, if you're someone who's struggling, here is the word for you this morning. Because, you know, I, I, when I gave, when I was preparing, when I gave this title itself, I was just asking God, is this one you want me to preach? I'm a guest preacher. Should I go ahead and preach? My God, my God, why? Because the title itself doesn't sound. Because when I was sharing this with my wife, my wife was asking, do you really want to share this message? 
but i know but i i would i was was preparing and i was praying i know this is something uh and that's what i want to say if you are here this morning you are not here by accident definitely i am not here by accident that's what i know even though i am here for the very first time but i am not here by accident because god wants to hear god wants you to hear this word this morning the first is the trouble of the psalmist the second is the trust and now if you look at there are five affirmation that the psalmist makes five affirmations and i want us to look at one by one what are these affirmations and in during these difficult times i want us to make this as our affirmation i want you to make this as your affirmation as we read through the psalms back to psalm 22 now verse 3 look at what he says he cries he couldn't find god but look at verse 3 he says yet yet you are enthroned as the holy one of israel you are the one israel praises the first affirmation is the position of god is the position of god here the psalmist yes he couldn't find god he's crying out he couldn't hear any answers from god all that he is hearing is the silence of god but he know one thing very deep in his heart my god is sovereign he is still on the throne Amen. Yes, the world around us during the last 2 years changed upside down. The things that we never saw in our lifetime have we have witnessed it and things have changed. But you know what? But in all this situation the psalmist could look back and say, "My God is still on the throne. My God is still sovereign. My God is still at work." And this morning dear people of God, in your life, in your situations, I don't know whether these three laments could be the oh, same lament or you want to add another lament but whatever it is dear people of god remember god is still on the throne in your pain he is still on the throne he is watching you he is still in control he is still able lazarus can be dead and he can be dead for 3 days but my god can come he can wake up the dead he can call out the name of lazarus and say come back and this morning dear church in your life in your life situations may you experience that power of god that you will say my god is still on the throne just as like the psalmist may you remember the position of god in your life that he is always watching over you that he is always with you and he is always on the throne that's the first affirmation that's the first affirmation god you're on throne may you and i just like habakkuk if you look at habakkuk is just a similar story a similar cry at the, if you look at the book of habakkuk you will see that the habakkuk uh, the prophet habakkuk begins with complaining god all this is happening is complaining complaining but when you come to chapter 3 you will see the things haven't changed still the situations are same but his trust in god has changed saying god there may not be enough harvest there may not be enough fruit in the field there may not be sheep there may not be cattle but i will rejoice in the lord amen that happens only when you know who your god is and what he is of and this morning may you and i understand that knowing my god is still on the throne my god is all powerful my god is the creator of heavens and the earth my god is the one who when he says something it happens that's the god we have because at his word the heaven and earth were created at his word everything that we see came into existence if that's the god we serve may you allow god to speak into your life say god you are on the throne speak into my life i know you are all powerful just what we see in the next couple of verses look at verse number 4 and 5 he says the second affirmation in new our ancestors put their trust they trusted and you delivered them to you they cried out and were saved and in you they trusted and were not put to shame the second affirmation is god's power because here the psalmist recalls how god miraculously delivered the israelites out of egypt we all know about the 10 plagues we all know how god miraculously opened the red sea how god provided for them you know how god provided for them in the wilderness whether it is water from the rock or it is manna from heaven or whatever it is it is god who miraculously provided 
you know, when we talk about the Red Sea, was it a Red Sea or a Reed Sea or many questions that happens, but whatever it is, but there was a sea that was able to cover up Pharaoh and his army into the water and deliver the Israelites from their enemies. And that is the power of God. And that's what the power that this psalmist is recalling saying, my God, you are powerful. If you are able to deliver our ancestors in the past, you are able because just like what the, uh, the writers in the New Testament say, our God is same yesterday, today and forever and he will remain the same. Hallelujah. And in your life this morning, if you're confronted with problems that are too big, let me tell you, there is nothing too big for our God. There is nothing to him, nothing impossible with our God. And now, just like what Jeremiah would say, tell me, is there anything too hard for God? No. You know, I love this song. Sometimes we leave some songs in the Sunday school and we don't sing that in the church. Isn't it? You know, there are, I love some of the Sunday school songs. They are sound theologically and they are very meaningful. No, like, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Say, nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Tell me, when was the last time you sang that song? We think, okay, that song is only for the little children. And when we go through the problems, we don't sing that, isn't it? Because that is the truth. That is what the Bible says. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Because the hand of the Lord is not too short to save you. And this morning in your problems, may you affirm, may you have the same affirmation saying, uh, with my God, nothing, nothing, and nothing is too hard for him. Because he is still on the throne. He is still all powerful. His name is El Shaddai, which means almighty. And dear people of God, in your situations this morning, may you know your God is powerful. Situations may push you to say, where is God? I can't see him. Oh, I can't find him. I can't hear him. But may there be that trust and hope in our hearts saying, my God is still on the throne. My God is still watching over me. My God is still able to deliver me. That is the second affirmation that we see. The third is what we read in verse number nine. Look at when people are insulting at him saying, oh, he trusts in God, let people deliver him. Let God deliver him. But in all those times, look at what he says in verse 9. Yet, once again, you see that word yet there. No, that is something very important for the whole psalm as we read through. Yet, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. You see here, the third important affirmation is the purpose of God. We looked at the position of God, the power of God, and the purpose of God. Let me tell you, the psalmist really knows that he is not here by accident. He is not on earth by accident. He is not in that situation by accident. Because he knew that God with a clear purpose created him in his mother's womb. With a clear purpose, he has placed him. And he knows that he is not an accident. He is a beautiful creation of God. And he is on earth with a purpose. Amen. Yes, and because God has per, uh, created him with a purpose, God has placed him with a purpose, God is not going to be silent. Yes, Jesus loved Martha and uh, Lazarus, Lazarus and uh, Mary. He loved them. But what, would, what was the immediate response of Jesus? When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he immediately packed up his back and went to meet Lazarus. No, that's, that's what, I don't read that in my Bible. But what we read is he stayed back because God knew the purpose. The purpose of a sickness would lead to death. And the, and the purpose of death would bring glory and honor unto God. Because when Jesus raised Lazarus from death, there were many people who were touched by the work of Jesus and the power of Messiah. And many were trusted in Jesus. And that's what we read, read in Gospel of John chapter 11. And let me tell you, in your weakness, all your weakness and struggle could lead to bring glory and honor unto him. So you and I need to just trust in the purpose of God. Because let me tell you, there is nothing called as coincidence. Uh, everything happens with a purpose and for the glory of God. And this morning, if you are seated here, that's why I said at the beginning, you are not here by accident because God has a purpose. You are going through the situations in your life. It is not an accident. It is the purpose of God. And whatever you might be, Today, it is the purpose of God. Your workplace is a place where God has placed you to bring glory to Him because that is the purpose of God. That is the purpose. 
Never discredit what happens in your life. Never discredit people who come around you because God has placed you. God is working in you because he has a purpose in your life. Quickly, the fourth, uh, the fourth affirmation is the pro. Uh, the fourth affirmation is the providence that we read in verse 10 and 11. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me. So trouble is near and there is no one to help. The fourth important, pro, uh, the fourth important uh, affirmation is the affirmation of providence. He's, you know, it is like I came without any expectation into this earth as a baby. You are the one who fed me with my mother. Just like what I love this psalm, Psalm 131, where the psalmist says, I don't care about anything. I'm just like a wean child. Because a wean child doesn't ask his mother, now I stop drinking milk, now give me, okay, some biscuits, give me surulai, give me, okay, whatever it is. The, a baby doesn't ask, a wean child doesn't ask. The mother knows what to give and the psalmist compares himself to that. I came into this earth, you provided for me. You made sure that how I'm going to be fed, how I'm going to be taken care of. You know everything and you know everything because you are my provider. And that is the affirmation that the psalmist makes. And this morning, in your need, whatever might be your need, a financial need, an emotional need, or whatever it is, you and I need to be reminded this morning that our God is our provider. A God is a provider. I don't know whether it is on a mountain. When Abraham went to sacrifice his son, God made sure that there is provision on the other side. When he obeyed God from one side and there was a provision on the other side and that's the place that Abraham calls Jehovah, Jireh. Most of the time we think it is God who provides. No, it is not just God who provides. If you go back and read the original meaning of the word, it is God who sees to it. It's not just your provision. He sees you and he knows what you need and he will see to it. And that's what Abraham declared on that day. May you and I have the same affirmation. Whether you are born as a baby not knowing anything or now you are able to do many things. May you and I have the same affirmation saying, uh, I know I have greater things but my God is able to provide. May you and I go with that uh, affirmation this morning. My God will see to it. I have Jehovah Jireh who will see to it. I have a God who is watching over me. I have a God who is all powerful. I have a God who has a purpose in my life. And I have a God who provides for me. Finally the fifth affirmation in this psalm is. What we read in verse number 19 and 21. He says. But you Lord do not be far from me. You are my strength come quickly to help me from a point where he says my god my god why have you forsaken me from a point where people looked at him and said oh he cries out to god let let his god deliver him now he comes to a point saying my god is my strength isn't it a beautiful isn't it a beautiful you know uh, affirmation in the lord saying my god when he promises he will do it and that is the fifth affirmation and this morning you and I need to have that, stray, that strong affirmation in our heart and our mind this morning. When God says something, he will do it. That's the song that we've been singing both in the first service and second service. When he says he will do it because he is not a man to lie. But he is a God when he promises he will do it. For Israelites it was 400 years. But he did it. And the promise of Messiah was at the beginning. And Christ Jesus came in at the right time to deliver us so that you and I off I'm not your color I'm not I don't speak the language that you speak but today we are all together because that promise of God was fulfilled because from the very beginning the promise of God was to restore people back unto him and today you and I are back unto him because of the promise that we have received from God Almighty these are the five affirmations that we see and during your difficult times during the times of struggle and pain, may you and I have the same affirmation. Yes, there can be times that we can cry out and feel the absence of God. But let me tell you, he's not absent. He's still seated on the throne watching over you. There may be times people mock at you. But let me tell you that God is going to come around you and surround you with his love. There can be times that you can feel that all those around you are like animals, lions and bulls and dogs. But let me tell you, in all those things, there is a great purpose of God that he will not let you. Because when God comes, it might be late, but he comes on time. 
There might be situations that you are broken, but let me tell you, as you climb up on the mountain with faith, there is provision on the other way. It can be a material provision. It could be anything that you're expecting. God will do it. He is Jehovah Jireh who sees to it. And may he see to it this morning. And as we looked at the psalmist, this, this psalm doesn't end there. It talks, up, it talks about a Messiah as well. And with this I close. The third important truth that we see in the psalmist is the transformation he knows. Because if you see the psalmist in verse 22 to 26, he talks about the vows that he will make, the vows that he will keep. And in verse number 27 to 31, he sees the vision in this psalm. But in all these things, it also shows about Christ Jesus. Because on the cross, Christ Jesus cried out this psalm, cried out this psalm saying, my God, why God, why have you forsaken me? You see, you can identify yourself with the psalmist, but I, I don't think so to the very fullest. But here is Jesus who could identify God who came down to this earth, became one among us so that you could experience that forsakenness. So that you and I who are forsaken will be redeemed back to him. You and I who are thrown, gone away from him will be brought back to him because that is the very plan of God from the very beginning that you and I will be restored back unto him. He was forsaken so that we will not be forsaken. We will be united back unto him. I don't have time but to just point out three things. That the psalmist, what he says is very rightly reflected in the life of Jesus upon the cross. Three things and with this I close. Gospel of John very clearly mentions and we would have meditated that on Good Friday during the seven sayings. I thirst. And look at what the psalmist says in verse 15. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And here is Jesus who went through all that agony so that you and I will be saved from that. And in verse number 16 you see that he was pierced. His hands and feet were pierced. Why? For us. And in verse number eight, in 18 we see they divide my clothes among them. And cast lots for my garment. And you know what? One beautiful thing. If you are around. If a person was sitting next to you. It could be a spouse. It could be a family member. It could be a close friend. If they are not able to understand you. That's okay. But we have a greater one. Who stepped down from heaven. Who became one among us. As he, the writer to the Hebrew says. That he understands our weakness. He understands our pain. There is no one could understand me. Better than him. No one can understand you better than him. People around you may not understand you. They might be mocking at you. But you and I have a God who understands us better than anyone. He identifies with our weakness. And he knows when you say, I am struggling. He knows what you say. When you say that I am, I am insulted. I am in pain. He knows what it is. Because he was inter insulted. He was slapped on his face. His beard was pulled. He went through all the humiliation and pain and struggle because each of you was seated here. But you know the beauty of the psalmist is in verse, what we read in verse 31 of the psalm. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet born, he has done it. And you know what? We don't just have the crucifixion in front of us. But we are people who live after that. What is that? That is the resurrection. That is the resurrection of Jesus. And that is the triumph that you and I celebrate this morning. We don't just talk about Jesus on the cross. We don't just talk about the death of Jesus Christ. We don't just talk about the burial of Jesus Christ. But we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you and I are here, it is because of his resurrection. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the God whom we serve. We can cry out today, my God, my God, why upon the cross? But three days later, something marvelous, something historic, something that changed the world upside down happened. And that is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is a sign. You and I are the visible sign and the trophies of His grace, of His resurrection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that is the God we serve. Today you might be in situations that are unexpected, that are difficult, that are painful. But may I urge you 
to have the same affirmations as the psalmist. And may you also know Christ Jesus. He came, he died, and he resurrected. And what a joy that he's going to come again. Hallelujah. What a great hope fills our heart that he's coming again and we are going to meet this resurrected king. And because he resurrected, we have that hope that we will resurrect again. Hallelujah. The dead who have gone before us will rise up first. But what a joy if we are alive that we will be caught up. But the hope is because he resurrected, we have great hope. Because he resurrected, we will also resurrect. Because he resurrected, let me tell you, there is victory and we can sing death. Where is your sting? Because my God, your God has won the battle. So this morning, dear church, we stand on the victory ground. We don't need not to fight the battle. He's fighting our battles. He has won the battle and he is victorious. And we stand on the victory ground, proclaim that victory. My God, my King, he has won the battle. And all that we do is claim, proclaim that victory to the world. Hallelujah. And if you're crying out, my God, my God, why? May you and I sing the victory song just like what we've been singing this morning. That he has conquered the death. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered everything. And in your life, my life, he has conquered everything. May the Lord bless us this morning. But I want to just close with this. If you are here with, in the presence of the Lord, I don't want you to miss out on responding to God's word this morning. Would you close your eyes? I look to God. Say, God, yes, I have gone through those times of silence from you. I have gone through those times of humiliation from others. I have gone through times that I felt I am nothing. And that's how I feel. And if you are here in this place, let all the eyes be, eyes be closed. But I want you to just take a minute to respond to God's word. Feel free to sit. Feel free to stand. Feel free to kneel down. Whatever you like to do. But if you are here. Who is in that pain this morning. Would you just put your hands on your heart. Would you put your hands on your heart. May the Lord see you this morning. May the Lord fill you with that hope and strength. Because we are people who are triumphant. We are people who are victorious. We are people who have experienced the power of resurrection. So may that hope of God come upon your life. So would you just place your hands upon your heart. I'm going to pray. Father, I pray for every hand that is placed upon their hearts this morning. Lord, those people who have thought that it is over, it is finished. May they realize this morning. If you are seated here, if you are thinking this is the end, it is over, it is finished. But the Lord comes to you and says, as he says in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18, that it is not over, it is not finished. The Lord is longing and he is coming around you to be gracious to you this morning. Father, I pray for every hand that is upon the heart. I pray that you touch them. I pray, dear God, may these affirmations come alive to each of us. That along with the psalmist, that we will sing triumphantly knowing, my God, you're still on the throne. Bless us together, Lord. Be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.